We're, <clears throat> we're reading two, two readings this morning. One from the Ancient Wisdom, as translated by Reverend Dr. Wilda C. Gaffney, and one from Modern Wisdom, which, uh, Modern Witness, which is by Todd Howard Hawks. The Ancient Wisdom, Acts chapter 2, verses 43 through 47. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by all the apostles. All who believed were as one and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as all had need. Daily they continued with the same purpose in the temple. They broke bread at home and ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. They praised God and had the gratitude of all the people. And day by day, the Holy One added to their number those who were being saved. When I read the Modern Witness um, that we're going to read now, I was reading a book, and that book had, as characters in the book, had a a lesbian couple, an older woman and a younger woman who were falling in love. And the older woman was having trouble because she couldn't really believe, she couldn't really believe that her friends and her family could accept her if she came out to them as lesbian. And I couldn't help but think since the uh, Pride Day was yesterday, or today, I guess, <laughs> the Pride Day is today, I couldn't help but think about the fact that this reading that we're about to read relates to the fact that that older woman had an epiphany as she was going to Pride Day in the book. And she, she said, now I understand Pride Day is not being about is not about being proud of being lesbian. It's about being proud of being yourself. Whoever you are, wherever you are. Pride Day should be just as much about each one of us being proud of ourselves as it is about Lesbians being proud of who they are, or gays, or anyone else. Now, you're going to hear a little bit different take on the modern witness, but think about that as we read this modern witness. What if each one of us were free each day to do, to give to the rest of us, ourselves, and share our real selves with everyone who walked by us on their paths of living, of being, of, re of realizing their hopes and wishes, their dreams, their needs for being genuine, foregoing the facades of existence, showing only honesty, no cosmetics of I hope they will like me, even love me, my heart so desperate to be touched by realness, not by pretensions and lies, but only by truth. Our worlds at once different and the same. Craving the clean air of authenticity, breathing deeply openness, and this is who I truly am perfectly imperfect, my self-acceptance, my gift to you and to all and to the world. A word of God that is still speaking. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? 
Merciful God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O God, our help and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, earlier this week, I had one of those days that was just a bumper day in the life of ministry. Um, rose early, got our kids dressed, brought them down to my church for our VBS. They were excited to come <laughs> and uh, got to lead the, the kids in a Bible story time talking about Jesus, inviting his friends to come and join him um, to be a part of the, the community that he was building. I left that section of VBS to come back to my office to, to finalize the last touches on our pub theology conversation for that night. I was so excited to do that. We were talking about God, country, and the 4th of July, and I knew it would be a very exciting conversation with our group. Then I jumped back to VBS to dance to Will I Am's I Like to Move It, Move It, which I've already referenced, but um, hoping there were no videos. I went from there to the, the end of VBS that day, um, grabbed a quick lunch, visited one of our members who's nearing the end of life and is probably the most faithful person I've ever seen approach that end. I went from there to visit a, a new mother in our congregation and hold that newborn baby and get to, to bless that little one with flowers and diapers. <laughs> And then came back to Zoom with our moderator, Ruth, as we finalized plans for today's congregational meeting and all of the things that we're going to be talking about today. And it was a day, as I reflected on it, I thought, this is a day of real good church. This is a day of really good church. And it reminds me why I love this calling, why I love our particular congregation, why I want everyone to know about this community of faith here at the corner of 5th and Main for almost, well, over 150 years. I want everyone to know about Hillsboro and our church, who we are and what we're about. I want everyone to hear good news from a still-speaking God whose love and compassion is everlasting, like the psalm told us, Psalms 36, 7. And I was thinking, like, you know, real good church. That's, that's what we're focusing on this summer. So this is the point where I bring out the book we're going to read. So here. <laughs> so we've invited everyone to join our deacons as we do a summer read of this book, Real Good Church. And it's, it's more of a manual than it is a, a narrative, but it has lots of stories in it. Um, and it's, it's talking about how this particular pastor of this particular church that was averaging 35 people on a Sunday morning and had only about $200,000 left in the bank, how they came back to life from the dead, as she says it. They went from having six children in Sunday school to 100. I'm not sure I'm ready for that. But it piqued my interest. It piqued my interest, and it got me thinking about what is real good church to us? What are the, the hallmarks of really good church? So, raise a hand. Tell me, what's real good church to you? Loud enough so I can hear it and repeat it on the microphone. Friends. Friends. Welcoming. Welcoming. Mm-hmm. Community service. Community service. Acceptance. Acceptance. Activities. A good sermon. A good sermon. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Lively, music. Lively music. We sort of know. Yes. A caring community. A caring community. Yes. Tradition. Tradition. No judgment when you walk in late. No when you walk in late. <laughs> yes. Exploration, mm-hmm, an openness. Goofy. Able to be goofy, <laughs> yes. Children, Children. wisdom, mm. love. love, yes. 
joy and enthusiasm, togetherness, togetherness. Playfulness. playfulness, age diversity. Age diversity. Yes. Other diversity. (laughs) All kinds of diversity. Yes. These are some of the things we think about when we think about real good church. I've had moments in my life when I've experienced something and I said, oh, that was really good church. That was just the kind of community that I hoped for. That was the kind of worship that I was longing for. That was a word that I really needed to hear. There are all these things that um, we talk about, uh, you know, not just having authentic relationships, but relationships where you can be a little goofy, that you can be yourself. You don't have to put on some some false face just to enter that space. You know, service-oriented community that we're, we're not just, you know, focused on ourselves, but we're looking to our neighbors and our neighborhoods. No one mentioned it, but my real good church involves a lot of food. Potlucks, banquets, barbecues. Time when we have to to practice table fellowship with one another, to be together. And of course, worship that is inspiring and uplifting and is lively and exciting. These are all the hallmarks of real good church. I think we're all longing for real good church. We all want to be a part of a real good church. We want to help create a real good church. A reading from Acts chapter 2, verse 43 through 47, um, gives us a window into what real good early church looked like. As they gathered, they were gathering in a sort of dynamic worship community. And yes, it was diverse. If you remember our sermon from a few weeks ago about Pentecost, there were people from all over the known world gathered there. Not just from different places, but speaking different languages with different ethnic backgrounds. It was a radically connected community. They were sharing all things in common. They they cared about who was being fed at the meal, making sure that no one got left out. They were justice-oriented. They were spiritually rooted. They They were praying daily together and practicing table fellowship with joy together. Gaffney says they praised God and had the gratitude of all the people. Imagine if your neighborhood came over and said, I'm so grateful your church is there. I'm so grateful you're there at the corner of Fifth and Main. You know I hear that? I go out and I'm coming in and out of the building and people are walking by with their dogs. We're like, I don't go to church, but I'm so grateful your church is here. (laughs) And I'm like, thank you. And I want to know more about that. I want to talk more and share more about our church. Because we do have the gratitude of people around us. People who are grateful for the the, the groups that meet in our building and use our space to have orchestras or AA recovery meetings, all sorts of other supports for those who are houseless, This real good church, this image of real good church, you know what the the final hallmark was? It says, day by day, the Holy One added to their number. Isn't that interesting? I remember uh, soon after I arrived at this church about seven years ago, someone came up to me and said, you know, I love what you're doing, but I really hope our church doesn't turn into one of those mega churches. I said... That seems like that would be very hard to believe. <laughs> I, I had to laugh. I mean, I don't, I don't think we're in any real danger of becoming a, a multi-thousand member church. But I, I was, again, curious about that. I said, well, where is that, where's that coming from? And I think where it was coming from is I didn't want to lose my sense of, of knowing the people next to me in the pew. I didn't want to lose those friendships that I've always had. Or didn't want to feel so much change that I never felt at home. Didn't feel like I was a part of what was being done and how that church was being lived out. And yet there's, there's a real importance for any church. Obviously, you have to, to be a sustainable community, you have to continue to grow 
and change. There's a, a necessary part of that. Which is why this summer we're talking about growth. And what I like about this book, about Real Good Church by Reverend Molly Finney Basket, is that she calls herself a doomsday Pollyanna. A doomsday Pollyanna is a person who looks at all of the, the, the challenge and the maybe scary realities of the world and says, I'm going to have hope anyway. I'm going to believe and I'm going to keep working in, with a spirit of optimism. Now, this church was in a bad place. Like 30 members. Just a few. They figured they had just a couple years left to, to make their church um, kind of vital again. There was a sense of urgency that they had to make some changes if they were going to survive. Survival is a powerful motivator. But she opens a chapter entitled Doom, Gloom, and a Kernel of Hope with a section, she says, what we're, what we're up against. She says, we've all read the same articles about the decline of the mainline church, the rise of the nuns, the people raised without any organized religion. I'd add the duns, the people who are done with organized religion. She says, we've all read those articles about the end of Christianity as we know it. Great, churches have died and are dying, will die, but that doesn't mean they all will. Some of our churches will make it. The reality is we're not losing our, to demographic changes. We're losing them to bad messaging and to brunch, at least in my neighborhood. She says, Christianity has committed the sin of being hateful and violent. I won't trot out all the, the whole list, that, but it begins with Constantine and ends with Fred Phelps and Westboro Baptist. So nearly as bad, it has committed the sin of being boring and fake. She says, I'm, I'm not going to bash the church anymore. That's what Facebook is for. <laughs> she says, we have work to do. She says, people ask me a lot, what one thing made a difference in turning your church around? And I answer, we didn't do one thing. We did a lot of things. This book will tell you exactly what we did and how we did it. Not all of these things will work in your setting or culture, but lots of them will. And I was thinking about this, and you know, for our church to remain healthy and vital, we have to continue to, to make goal, growth a goal, to, to work together to do this. We have had a growth committee for all the seven years that I've been a part of this church, and it's usually been three or four people who've met somewhat irregularly, and we have a budget of $200. And it's focused mostly, mostly on advertising for a few special events. We've been hoping that people would come and visit our church and like it so much that they'd stay. I mean, you walk through those doors, you get a welcome from Barb, and you just feel at home. It's, we've, we've been counting on that to, to help people stick around. And then maybe they'll join our new members class. And I've realized that what we've been doing is good, but maybe, maybe we can do a little better. Because I look around and I, I want our church to look like our neighborhood. The other day, it was a Sunday afternoon, and our kids were, you know, just come home from church. They were sugared up on juice and donuts, and um, they had a lot of energy. We thought, well, we'll go down to the community pool and swim for a few hours. So we went down to Shoot Park, and I went into the pool there, and I looked around, and I thought, Oh my goodness, I've never seen something more beautiful. There were all these people of different ages and body types and abilities, different skin tones and ethnicities, languages. And I thought, this is what beloved community looks like. This is what the kingdom of God looks like. How can we make Sunday morning look more like Sunday afternoon at Shoot Park? And so I got to thinking like, about growth and how we're going to get there. Some smart person over at National um, was working on a list of uh, marks of faithful and vital local churches. And so they made a board game called How to Grow Your Church, uh, Engaging the Marks of Faithful and Vital Congregations. So I got it. I ordered it. It came in the mail. 
And I opened it up, and you know what I found inside? Well, there was a, there was a praise band, and an espresso machine, and a youth pastor who was young and hip, and who, who worked 40 hours a week for four seventy-five an hour. And I thought, wow, this is it. Just what we needed. Of course, it doesn't have those things. There's no simple solution to growth, right? There's no, you know, five easy steps to growing your church. But this, um, this game and these marks are actually very helpful. These are descriptive, not proscriptive. And I, I hope some of you will join me as we, as we play this game later this summer. I was going to join it, uh, I was going to trot it out this afternoon at our barbecue, but um, we'll have to save it for another time. But the researchers at our denomination headquarters analyzed UCC churches that were growing, that did have a sense of vitality. And they said, you know, what are the things, what are the marks that are helping them grow? Um, so they're not saying you have to be all these things, but they're saying the churches that are growing are marked by these things. These are churches known for exhibiting a spiritual foundation and ongoing spiritual practice, engaging sacred stories and traditions, shaping church community, organizing community with intention, building leadership skills within the local church, caring for the wider community, working together for justice and mercy, and living into United Church of Christ identity. These are wonderful things, and there's you know, even more to sort of explore under each heading, but I thought, you know, we're doing some of these things really well. I've seen some really good church this last year. I was thinking about our uh, Renegade Soul Sisters and our Thursday morning Bible study and our pub theology and I was thinking about our Tuesday Reflectors and our men's breakfast group. I was thinking about the amazing work that Mission and Outreach does every month and our Sunday school and VBS where kids are excited to come and excited to be a, a part I was thinking about our choir and bell choir and strum and sing and all these other groups that have, have made sort of avenues for people to connect and have that authentic community that they are searching for, to have an experience of the divine that they've been longing for. I thought, we're doing all right. And I wonder if there are ways that we can continue to grow, continue to step into more faithfulness. Now, I, for one, am not one who believes in the fact that churches have to grow for their own sake, that growth is, is important for our, you know, our own survival, other than that God calls us to be faithful, and that when we're faithful, we do find growth. I don't believe we need to, to go out today after worship and start knocking on doors and working to save souls that way, but I do know that we have a witness to give in our community. I do believe there are a lot of people in this world who are yearning for deeper meaning, who long for the kind of community that we strive to create here. And I know that for us to remain vital and growing, for us to be faithful to the call that God has given us, we must continue to grow. We must continue to work together for that goal. And it's not going to happen with just two or three people on a committee. It's not going to happen with just $200 in a budget line. It will take all of us in all areas of church life working together, thinking together, imagining together what God will do in our midst. Now, I believe this church is vital and growing, and I've seen that. I've seen evidence of it. But I'll say, you know, maybe not every church needs to continue. There are churches I know that have faithfully closed their doors. There's a church, Hubbard UCC, had a shrinking congregation and decided to become a different kind of religious community. They called themselves Heart to Heart. It was an interfaith spiritual community um, here in our conference. For them, new life came through death and rebirth. I don't believe that's this congregation's story. But I believe 
that our community desperately needs a progressive church in the heart of downtown Hillsboro, and that we are that church. As we lean into that identity, as we lean into that calling, I know people will find us, but we also have to be open and looking for them and invite them to be a part of what happens here. Throughout uh, the last few months, we've been doing a little bit of visioning and strategic planning. And in our different boards, we've been doing a, a little exercise called the Animal Farm Game. And I haven't um, done it with all of the boards, so I won't give it all away. But um, one of the exercises was to, to name some of the dinosaurs in your, <laughs> your area. Things that are dying or have already gone extinct or need to go extinct. It was a fun way of talking about the ways that um, some things don't work forever. Some things need to be let go of and start again, to be born again. Um, I think there'll be some of that in our life. There's some things that we, we can't do all things for all people. We have to be strategic. We have to decide what are the things that we're called to right now. But I know we can do that together. I know that as we're in conversation with one another, as we faithfully live into our, our call, that God will meet us and the Spirit will guide us. And that there is so much wisdom and spirit in this room that we will be blessed and God will help us find our way. So there's more to say, but for another day. Thank you for being the church in this place and in this time, for showing up, and I am excited about what lies ahead. I hope you are too. Amen. Amen.